Hi, my name is Chris Malcolm. And my name is Zach Tolby. We're meteorologists at the National Weather Service in Reno. Last time we talked about the official Climate Prediction Center forecast. They were forecasting equal chances of above or below normal precipitation. Today we're going to look at the science of what makes it so challenging to predict the winters here in the Sierra Nevada. So believe it or not, there's more to forecasting our winters around here than just rolling the dice. One aspect to the climate here in the Sierra and Nevada is that we get a sizable percentage of our annual precipitation from just a handful of winter storms. Recent research by Mike Dettinger and collaborators has shown that in wet winters, we often get four to six of these big atmospheric river or pineapple express storms, but in dry ones, it can be as little as one or zero. Forecasting when or how many of these storms will hit is virtually impossible more than a week or so in advance. Next, let's look at what El Nino means in the Sierra. To understand the correlation between precipitation and El Nino in the Sierra, we're going to have to look at some correlation graphs. It's a little complicated, but stick with me. First, let's quickly look at the Southern California Climate Division, so you know what this graph would look like when there is a correlation between El Nino and precipitation. On the bottom of this graph is the Southern Oscillation Index, and represents El Nino conditions on the left, La Nina on the right, and neutral conditions in the middle. The vertical axis rep represents the amount of precipitation received from October through March in inches of water. The dots on this graph represent all of the winters since 1933. So for Southern California, there is some correlation between El Nino and higher precipitation, where the red dots are higher on the left. It also receives less precipitation during La Nina, the blue dots being lower on the right. As you can see, not every El Nino produces the same effect, and in general, La Nina has a more consistent signal. The relationships are not perfect because the Earth's climate is a complex, chaotic system, and El Nino is only one of the variables. Okay, now let's look at what El Nino means for the Sierra. This map shows a network of eight precipitation gauges in the northern Sierra. The precipitation data for the Sierra makes more of a shotgun pattern that is almost perfectly distributed. What this means is that El Nino and La Nina explain basically none of the variance of precipitation for the northern Sierra. Here is the same graph for five stations in the southern Sierra. Again, no correlation. The central Sierra is basically at the pivot point between the areas where El Nino has the strongest influence on precipitation. That is why El Nino doesn't have a strong correlation with precipitation here in the Sierra. We've had dry El Nino winters, and we've had wet ones, and the same goes for La Nina. Finally, there's another wild card to our winter outlook, a rather persistent warm bubble of water in the Northeast Pacific Ocean. This map shows where ocean waters are unusually warm, the oranges and the reds. The warm area in the Northeast Pacific has nothing to do with El Nino. It's a separate phenomenon that has been around for several years, and we're unsure how long it may last. The reason we bring this up is the warm bubble was associated with persistent high pressure over the western U.S. last winter, which drove our storm track well to the north of the region. Whether or not this warm bubble contributes to the blocking high again this winter, we don't know. On a related note, NOAA has learned that this warm bubble of water has impacted the types of fish that are in the North Pacific Ocean. Good for tuna, apparently, but bad for salmon. What we're going to look at next is not an official forecast. These are climate models that forecasters are using, and they're beginning to show some modest skill at seasonal prediction. But as we'll see, you have to be careful how you interpret these. This is called the North American Multimodel Ensemble. Ensemble forecasting basically means running multiple models or multiple runs of the same model with slightly different initial conditions, which gives us a better idea of the range of possible outcomes. These models are capable of dynamically predicting the seasons based on current ocean and atmospheric conditions. These models can solve complex relationships to conditions we haven't seen in the past, because like Chris alluded to, there is no analog to the widespread ocean sea surface temperature anomalies we are currently seeing in the northern Pacific Ocean, and we're not completely sure how that would, could influence our winter. 
Last month, the international and the North American models were showing remarkable consistency, forecasting a wet signal in the Sierra this winter. Unfortunately, now the consistency has been replaced by chaos. The international model is still showing some wet signal in California, while the North American model is now forecasting a drier than average winter. If we look at the eight models that make up the North American Ensemble, it turns out that seven of the eight models are showing dry signals in California this winter. The CFS is the only model showing a wet signal in California. This is the reason you have to be cautious looking at any one run of a single climate model. I know, this isn't what you wanted to hear. And it's not how I wanted to end our presentation, but it's exactly why it's so challenging to predict the winners here in the Sierra. Thank you to Dr. Kelly Redman at the Western Region Climate Center for his insight on this presentation. If you enjoyed this presentation and would like to see more interesting and timely weather information, you can like us on Facebook and Twitter at NWS Reno. Thanks for listening.